Should you be in a community of people like you? Or should you have a diverse community? Well, certainly there are dangers in being a community that is really specific to your group, your exact group of people who all agree with everything you do. It almost sounds dangerous. Such a group could be dangerous. It could also be isolated from, from the rest of society. On the other hand, inherently, the more values you share with the other people in the group, the less conflict you will have, the more common goals you're able to have, the more you'll be able to have businesses together, the more you can support each other, the more you can trust each other. This is a very strange dichotomy where we both want to have diversity and we need to plan for people of different ages, for example, you know, from baby till death. Uh, and we want to plan for different functions within a society. You know, we don't want to be as pure as a nunnery or a monastery. I guess they're gender separated, and in most cases that isn't going to work for people. It's not good for reproduction, generally speaking. Though, of course, we can always have gender separation and integration. Um, how and wh why we do that is just a choice of a community. Um, and we can also separate in other ways as well, because we move through different communities during our lives. So who we actually spend time with might vary over time. You know, and in different cultures, men and women are separated different or less than others. Uh, some more. Uh, in other ones, we're more separated by age, where the children spend their lives largely together, uh, guided by a few adults. And in others, they're integrated into uh, family units, uh, which I tend to think is healthier, of course, because then they learn from a wide variety of supportive humans. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think the nuclear family is, is a joke. It's bad. <coughs> uh, it's, it's weak. And I want to rebuild the extended family, but rebuild the chosen extended family so that we're choosing to be in a group of like-minded people. And people say all the time when they're trying to create a community, I want to be with like-minded people. And then they just leave it at that. Like, just saying it will mean, oh, the other people, of course, will be like me. No, you actually have to drill down into every detail of that and find out in what areas you are like-minded and what areas does that matter. If we break out a thousand different topics, not just individual questions or something, but a thousand different topics of areas of discussion, you know, areas of life, and then we start to see, see that some of those would be important in the cohesion and functioning of a community, and other ones are just kind of decorative. They don't matter to the survival of the group. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to, to get to that level of detail in our selection of other people for a diverse community. It's much harder than just picking a single person to be a partner with if you live in a society where you supposedly have monogamous relationships, which, by the way, don't exist. What we live in, is in, in, in most of the world, is serial monogamy, including infidelity, which results in endless conflict, and it always will. People develop differently than each other. People get together all the time who should never be together in the first place. They never did a full values check. They didn't go through a list of a thousand different things and say, what are our deal breakers? What really matters? And so they set themselves up for certain failure just because they want to, you know, they like each other's pheromones or or, or like each other's social status, or it appears on the surface that they would match up. But at some other fundamental levels, they have conflicts that will come to the surface or will limit them and, and keep them in an unhappy relationship for the rest of their lives, which is common. A successful relationship is not necessarily one that just stays together. That's like the minimum bar. You would ideally not just be even happy but you would be a highly functional unit working together to benefit both of you for common goals. And that goes true beyond any coupling that happens. You know, certainly we, we seem to couple up. I tend to couple up with people. If I have someone in my life, I don't tend to go off looking for other connections with other people. It's just, I'm kind of a homebody person 
And uh, even though I like adventure and variety, uh, if I'm getting my needs met in a relationship, I tend to focus on one person. That's just how it has happened. But I also have noticed that the times that I'm the most happy have been times where I retain connection with multiple other people. And that includes for intimacy, which is the controversial biggest topic, I suppose, uh, because we have this notion of monogamy. And certainly I, I see the dangers of promiscuousness for disease, for mistrust, for hurting people, for lying to people, for not having your goals be in tune when you thought that they were. Um, and the difficulty people have around that where they, you know, we have this whole till death do us part mindset when really we should just go into a relationship knowing that it will end. We live a long time. We have a lot of different needs. And it, it may or may not end. It could morph as needs morph. And that that can be okay. But we do not have the social structures defined to support that. That makes social circles very difficult. You've seen when couples break up in a social circle and then one or both of the members of that try and divide the social circle up, poison people's minds against the other person, and they see inherently that breaking up is bad when it doesn't have to be. Why let the breakup poison and ruin the entire relationship that presumably was positive at the beginning, positive enough to get into, the vision was good, the implementation was hopefully somewhat good, but even that, we shouldn't be in relationships with most of the people around us. And there are some people out there who are so starved for attention, and understandably so, so starved for support, that they get pretty upset if somebody doesn't accept them. So we see a lot of people with a, an enhanced feeling of rejection from other people, um, often people who, well, whatever, we're all damaged in some way. But, but you, you've seen how people don't accept rejection well. I, I do, actually, quite well. And I think it's a very important quality to have because most of the people in the world don't want to be with you in any intimate sense. And they shouldn't be. That's true of people for intimacy or also people to go into business with or people to have children with or people to raise a family with or be in a family with or to be in a church with or to be in, in a, even in a neighborhood with. In other words, I'm for neighborhood segregation. Great word to use because it triggers a lot of people, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think that that at all has to be along the, the normal discriminatory lines that we would like to break away from. So when I say we want to be with people like us, <clears throat> the first thing that comes to my mind isn't race. It isn't gender. It isn't age but rather values and goals, things that matter to the group for its cohesive survival. And people can be coming into that group and leaving that group under specific uh, guidelines that that group sets. And it be, could be different for every group. Some groups could be more fluid than others. There could be groups that were entirely nomadic and that just traveled all the time and that people joined them for a year, two years. And they travel, not necessarily the world, that seems rather expensive and ecologically a disaster. But, you know, there's like, like for instance, in the United States, there's a route you can travel where it's always 70 degrees. Well, I would go ahead and include Mexico in that. In fact, the guy who came up with the, the original map, he also included Canada. But I love Mexico. I live in Mexico. Am I supposed to say that on these videos? I'm not. I'm not supposed to say where I live. Fuck. Too late now. Don't tell anybody. And uh, I want to include all of Turtle Island and, and have, have this nomadic path people can be on. And it makes it easier to be a nomad if you're always in a place where the climate is right, where it's the most comfortable time of year to be there. I just saw a post online and somebody was like, I'm in my, you know, it's about car camping or something. And, uh, and, you know, being, being a digital nomad or I don't know what it was, some kind of traveling lifestyle. And they were like, what do I do? I'm freezing in my car. It's so cold. And people were like, get blankets and do this and do that. And I'm like, well, drive somewhere else. And then I posted a link with that map of where you can travel that is always 70 degrees. 
So even in as weird a community as one that is always traveling, you could have a group of people whose skills fit in with that, whose business fits in with that, whose ways of raising kids fit in with that, because kids, you know, often need a, a solid home structure. But then there's, you know, world schoolers or unschoolers that are traveling around. Wouldn't it be nice if you were traveling around with other people with kids and that you could then share the costs of taking care of those children for security, having properties all along the route from trusted people where those kids are going to be safe and secure? And this is true for young people as well. Do we want young people, you know, who, who we care about traveling around to random places, meeting random people, or we want them going from place to place where they're secure, they're fulfilled, they have more options to meet other people that share values with us, that are, where they're less, li- less likely to be victimized, where they're less likely to be drawn into cultures, very attractive cultures, which are actually horribly bad for them and are designed to use them up. They're designed to take them away from a a solid base of a community, if they have that. In fact, if anything, a well-designed community that was traveling like this could could take strays. They could pick people up that can fit into that traveling culture. And it'd be a totally different vibe uh, in any case, no matter which group it was traveling. But each traveling group within itself could also have different goals. They might be segregated by age because what you want when you're traveling, this is another area that's a good example, just like coupling, where tra- your travel partner, this is why traveling is a good idea for couples. It's often the stress that they need to find out if they, well, if they want to travel together. It, they could do, you know, a couple could be just fine in every area, but that their goals for travel could be different and they could go traveling and find out that they have conflicts. That doesn't even mean they're a bad couple. It might just mean that they're incompatible for traveling. There could be people who are in, in, you know, or couples who who are sexually not compatible. It makes for a strange idea, doesn't it? Because that's the first, that's the number one defining aspect of a what we would call a couple is that they are sexually intimate with each other. But there are actually people that fit really well together, but don't fit well together sexually those people still might want to be in the same family because they are are so functional together. And we've seen partnerships like that, business partnerships like that. And of course, it's always great if you could be a business partner with your intimate partner, but there's no particular reason that you have to be. If you define the set of values that, that let's, let's look at the family as this entity, as this blo- existing blob, right? Like a circus. I, I was at the, town and I was talking with people in a traveling circus and uh, Daniel Quinn in Beyond Civilization often uses circuses as a reference uh, as, a, as a group to, to consider how we can group together in communities. Um, people could, could come into that, they could leave from that, they could have business interests to keep them together for their survival because our survival really is what keeps a group together is if we need each other. And it's like, it would be great if every member of any group is so powerful that they could leave at any time. In fact, I believe that's critical for, for what I'm picturing as healthy groups, because then it's harder to victimize anyone. It's harder for anyone to be really authoritarian within it and slave and, and, and abuse each other. Uh, oh, I think the rain stopped. That's great. Um, so, so let's take and figure out what like-minded really is. And, and let's realize that within any group of people, a bunch of the people within it are not there for the benefit of the group. They're there for their own benefit to benefit more than the group. And you have to have mechanisms, cultural mechanisms built into the group's culture. Blah, sorry, that's repetitive. Uh, that protect against being abused by the individuals. Let's say we got a hundred people together and they all say they want to be in a community. A, I would argue, and this is a horrible thing to have to say, that the large percentage of those people are looking for a group in which they can take more than they give. Now, I don't know how to measure that. 
That's not a scientifically supported statement. I haven't done studies, but I've hosted enough people where I know that's how it works out in practice. Most people are looking for a group that they can be in charge of and abuse in some way. Most people are trained to be looking for relationships in which one way or another, they're abusive. That's a harsh, harsh thing to say. Might have something to do with why I'm alone. (laughs) But it's a useful point of view to get to, to really realize and admit that. Because if we can admit it, then we can design our communities to protect against those people, even when those people are ourselves. Because even though I tend to be somewhat of a dominant force, even though I'm very independent, even though in many ways I don't need other people, and I and I and because of that I've attracted people who want to use me, I have to seek out people who I find a win-win situation with, and I couldn't abuse them if I wanted to. Instead, we find that we... We benefit each other so much, and that's why we stay together. And if we weren't benefiting each other, everyone in the group has the ability and and self-interest to leave. And that group should dissolve. Or maybe it needs to split. Splitting isn't perfect because sometimes it just splits into groups of different different abusers as as it develops. So that's not a real guarantee. I would really like to seek out those those patterns and and elements and styles and cultures and tool sets that, that don't allow us to be bad functioning individuals within a community and not even in a relationship with one other person. And it's so difficult to do that. Uh, I can look at many philosophies we can, we can borrow and we can find out if we have agreement with other people on those philosophies enough to work together. For example, I recommend nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg. It's a book. There's a whole training series. I'm listening to the audio book now. Uh, Radical Honesty by Brad Blanton, I want to say. I forget his name. I'm not religious about these philosophies or ways of being. But choosing a a set of, of, of philosophies and saying, this is something we generally like, and then let's discuss it and break it down, is very wise. Do we want to live a lifestyle of conspicuous consumption using as much resources as possible and call that fun? Or do we want to live in a way that's light on the earth and has social wealth beyond the imaginings of most people? So that we have trusting, kind, creative, fun people around us that build us up and we're all teaching and learning? Or do we want a group of people that works because we're kind of forced to be together and not very self-aware of what our needs are and wants are and uncaring of what other people's needs and wants are. That doesn't sound like the relationship I want to be in, although many functional relationships are very imbalanced in that regard. And I don't know that we have to go the other direction and say, we can't have any hierarchy. Everyone has to be egalitarian and the same. We must all share incomes. No, that's ridiculous. And it often doesn't work. I'm not apparently a very good communist. I don't think it's good for a group to have it have as part of the rule set that everybody has to be all equal and share everything that they have. And many communities are set up like that. I talked with one community after I had made enough money that I was essentially able to retire. And one of their very fixed goals, very high up in their priority list, was we have to have total income sharing. Well, I didn't have a normal income. And so was I going to see everything I'd worked for for the previous decades be siphoned away by this group to support them and in some support of this imaginary equality when we clearly don't have equality? I don't feel like doing it. And I didn't really vibe with those people on an interpersonal level anyway. You know, they want to have cuddle parties together. I didn't feel like I knew them well enough that I wanted that kind of intimacy with the group. And I I didn't really feel that invited. I was. I was literally invited to join them in that way. But I'm a very shy person, really. 
and I don't get intimate with people easily. I'm not going to. I don't even think it's a good idea. Uh, now, they did actually kind of have the idea of more polyfidelity. Uh, they definitely wanted to make sure that everybody in the group was bisexual, which I don't feel like sleeping with men. Sorry, just uptight that way. And I don't think to be in a community to have cohesiveness with everyone else in the group that I need to be. It certainly is a very interesting and, and, and idea that everybody should be bisexual in your community. Great. How, then just state that. Write it down. Put it on your list of things. But that wasn't written down anywhere. In fact, that group had nothing written down. It was run by two people putting it together, and they were going to call the shots. In other words, it was going to be them in charge. And couples can be very dangerous in this regard when couples run a community. It's just as bad as when one individual does. In fact, it's, it's worse because they have more time to be authoritarian and they've got their small unit of authoritarianism together. You know, even, you know, like they say, behind every great man is a great woman. Well, whether it's a woman or a man in charge, if that person has one person they're coupled up with uh, in a very fixed and solid way, that just gives them more of a strong authoritarian unit to rule the group more. It's not the ideal. And so, again, we have to break it down into exactly which areas do we say that we have to be together on things and in which other areas are we independent. Let's look at time spent together. That's a big one. If your group is not functionally actually together, living together with face-to-face -face time, not over social media, not on telephone calls or letters, if, if you're not really together, then it's, it's hard for me to imagine it really being a functional group. Let's imagine a person who only wants to be a part of the group one day a year. Doesn't sound like a very good connection, does it? Doesn't even seem like it's worth it. You could barely say hello and goodbye once a year. What if they want to be in there one week a year? Sounds very similar to one day. How about a month? Again, still not working for me. There's people who, who uh, have a major connection with Burning Man as a festival or some other festivals that are great. And that's their, their family for that event. That's great and healthy and fun, but that does not make a group that works along all year. Now, maybe you have a bunch of people who go to that festival a year and then they work on it for the rest of the year to prepare for it or much of the rest of the year. And that's enough for connection to start to become meaningful. Do you need to live together? Not necessarily, but if you have to get in a car to drive to see the people you like the most that are really important to you, I already don't like that. I even think that for a business, I mean, we've gotten better at telecommuting, that's true, and, and telecommunications is so much better with webcamming and stuff like that. We can have databases that allow us to work better together and we can work virtually together. But the world we live in is physical. The functional needs we have are physical. We need to have somebody to watch you when you go up a ladder so if you fall off it, you know, somebody knows you're lying there with broken legs. One of the reasons I don't take a shower, that I haven't had a shower in like eight months, is because the only way I can get a shower is by going up a ladder and it's designed in a horrible way because it was just built that way. It's a bad design. It's actually an architectural problem keeping me from getting a shower. I've only got one shower, okay? And I have to bend down at the top of the shower, and I'm not very flexible still, and I'm actually not scared of heights, like I don't get quaky or wussy about it, but I just know that the risk of me falling two kilometers away from the nearest help with no phone signal is too high. And that's because I have to crawl up there and check the tank to see if there's water in it. Because I don't want to run out while I'm taking a shower. And then my power's out. And so I have to haul a generator down there on slippery roads where my van tends to get stuck because it's not four-wheel drive. In other words, I have multiple th reasons, because I'm living alone in the woods, I have multiple reasons why I would love to have other people around here just for basic functioning. 
Now, all of that can be fixed with better design, of course. And in general, I apparently can survive just alone. I can be alone a long time. And the benefits for being al me being alone have been immense. I've been able to think of things other people could never think of. It sounds weird to say that, and I don't know how true it is. I know it's at least partly true. Even just the mental space I'm able to have by not having constant inefficient people in my face all the time who need stuff is really good. That's depressing thought. Because when I think of having people in my life again, I immediately think I'm going to lose my whole life and not even be functional anymore and just attract a bunch of people who use me. And that's what exactly what will happen. And I've had conversations where people don't even realize that that's what they're promoting. That's the relationship they're saying will work for them. You know, it's the people who want to come and live for free. They want to escape the money system. Uh, they don't give a fuck what I want for values of my place. Uh, many of them very quickly become not exactly entirely abusive in an in a obvious way, but it's very obvious that they're looking for relationships with people who will do what they fucking say. And they will take over other people's resources to do it. Those are exactly the people you don't want to be in a community with. And if you're that kind of person, it's not going to work for you to be in a community. Some people have looked at me and said, I, they're critical of me. Well, you're alone because you're not doing things the right way. No, I'm alone because I don't have methods of protecting myself or filtering people and locating people I can actually have win-win positive relationship with. And you, a person who's criticizing me, is probably one of those people. You probably are one of those people. And I suspect most of us probably are. And in some ways, simply by defining what I'm willing to do in my life and what I'm not willing to do, what I want for my own family system that I'm part of, by saying that I'm particular, I am saying that there's a bunch of people I'm not compatible with. There's nothing wrong with that. You should do the same thing. And I also know enough about me to know it's, I'm not doing it because I want to be in charge of a bunch of other people. Although the conclusion I sometimes come to is I have to be. Instead, I would rather look at it, though, is that I want to define a set of values that I follow and then find a bunch of people who also want to live by those values. And sometimes I've called that the dictatorship of the doctrine, which I think is great because the word dictatorship scares the fuck out of people. But everybody should be dictator over their own life. But then we have to find ways to work together. By having a doctrine that we agree we're following, specific written documents stating what values we live by, how we're going to interact, how we're going to protect each other, how we're going to benefit each other, what our expectations are, then the the doctrine itself becomes a dictatorship that we agree, are agreeing to. And part of that doctrine is that we have ways of leaving that, that are healthy and good. And that within that, we're not held there by economic control, but we're free to go. If you're not free to go, things are going to get bad. That is the nature of people. It's the nature of communities. If you have a couple and one person in the couple has all the economic resources and the other one does not have an option to leave, the likelihood for abuse goes up. And it's not some random probability issue. It's not just luck. It's that it can happen. It's allowed to be able to happen. And so it will tend to happen. And you'll see behaviors in the person who's the, the uh, trapped one uh, you'll see behaviors in them that we would consider generally unhealthy. And you'll see generally unhealthy behaviors in the person who has power in the relationship. I was with a woman for a while, and she said something along these lines, you know, that, that if, if you have the power to leave, then you're in charge. She didn't state it that way. She stated it in a totally different way. But that's kind of what I think is the distilled meaning of it. 
the person willing to leave the relationship is the one in charge. And that, unfortunately, also equates to, to economic differences. And I'm okay with there being economic differences within a community a little bit. But I, because, you know, you look at kids, for example, they're obviously not economically viable. But we're still willing to give to them and we want to give to them and we need them in the group. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think we should necessarily be cranking out tons of kids within a community. I would rather see us adopting them because it's not like there's a shortage of people in the world who are who are lonely and need family. There, we, there's tons of them. And whether we're adopting them as adults or as children, we bring them in the community. But the immediate goal for anyone who does not have the financial and physical resources to leave the community is to build them up to a point where they can. We expect that with children. We expect them to get raised up and be more independent. I mean, I, I think this is what makes sense for child raising. Build up their skills, build up their abilities, and we don't want to lose them. That's not the goal. We're not trying to kick them out, hopefully. Although you do find communities that are very gender imbalanced in their relations. You know, Mormons, for example, or polyfidelitous folks with multiple wives where they end up getting rid of the boys. That's a terrible type of society. I don't want to be in it. You know, I am a boy. I have some empathy for that. So I, I don't recommend having unbalanced relationships in that way. Like having, um, I mean, we, we can look at that either way. We can evaluate communities where there's one woman with multiple husbands or one man with multiple wives. And it's going to, automatically cause a bunch of people not to have a partner, an intimate partner. That is going to, doesn't sound like a very healthy relationship to me for the society. And you could have both of those within your overall society. You could have people with specifically one, one wife and more than one husband and one husband and more than one wife. But then it's not that far a stretch to say, why not just go with polyfidelity? We've gotten rid of the gender issue, which is obviously is a common problem people are having. Uh, and we have gender wars all around us, and it makes no sense to me at all. Um, you know, and you have infidelity that's rampant. Uh, po polyfidelity, by the way, does not automatically get rid of infidelity. But it seems obvious to me that it would decrease the chances of it. Because you have in your group trusted people who are selected to be compatible with you, including sexually, some of them, and you have a sexual mores and ethics within the group that allow for that, that allow you to have safe sex within your family without having to be incest, <laughs> Although, you know, any polyphilous group is going to have to morph and evolve uh, to not be incest, obviously, because as, as, you know, what do children do then? Do they end up growing up and screwing with people who are in their family group? I, I've read about this problem with kibbutzes, right? Where people don't tend to, I mean, I don't know if this is true. I have to relook this up. You can go look it up. I don't, have time to know, I don't have time to know everything, but uh, children who were raised on kibbutzes tend not to want to have sexual relationships with the people they grew up with. They're like brother and sister. Now, that could just be made up. <clears throat> Something I read. Because you certainly see a lot of incest porn out there. And if they're not genetically related, if there's no genetic or biological problem with it, I don't know why it would be a problem. I mean, we, we can see why you don't want to be with your sister, your genetic sister or brother. There's actual biological problems with that if you do that too much. Um, and even cousins, you know, you don't want them intermarrying too much. And, of course, we can make lots of jokes about that. But it's quite likely that that's actually the most natural person for you to be with. Now, I've never been in a family situation where I had any desire or opportunity for that. So I'm not personally, you know, it's not my kink or something, you know. Um, but but that that's something to think about if we if we do imagine polyfidelous families over generations is that we're going to probably want to mix it up we actually want people to leave the group and to enter the group 
We want fluidity with the group. But we want that to be done in a way that is healthy for the group. We don't want to grow the group to a point where we've we've gotten over Dunbar's number. We're 140 people in a theoretical extended family, and we have to split it up because it's just too big a number for us to deal with on a pragmatic level. And I have thoughts about that. What's the right size of the polyamorous family or polyfidelous family? Three is a common number. Three also is very unstable because then you get in a thing where one person can be victimized by the other two. It's true that three legs makes a, a, a stool stand, a stool you sit on. Three legs is the minimum. Two won't work. Two is too weak. It's true for couples. This might be a fun analogy, really. Uh, so two two legs is too weak. Three, however, it, for you know, we're not stools, obviously. It's an analogy. But but with three people, there's always a temptation for somebody to get rid of another person because we 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 want to have somebody else to ourselves potentially. So I don't want two other people I'm in a relationship with. It can work. I've been the third leg in a couple before, and I was actually comfortable with that that part of that relationship, that aspect of it. I would have preferred to be the boyfriend. But that's inherently unstable if, if one person decides that they like want to change the dynamics of who's the dominant partner. So thruples are also, in my opinion, not very stable. Four people, still too small. It's better. And it could work even in that case, I think it would probably even work better. Well, I guess you could do it with any any gender balance. You could have, because what, what are your options? You've either got two, two men and two women. I'm assuming I'm being heteronormative here a little bit. And again, it still is good if people are bise bisexual. It would make things better. Like, let's say I had three wives. How is that different than me being with a, a, in a couple with another couple? And how is that different than me being with one wife and two husbands? Well, as a, as a heterosexual person, I can deal with any of those. Those are all fine. And I don't have to own someone sexually that they're my only, that I'm the only person they sleep with. But it's hard, it's hard for me to imagine being in a group with three guys and one woman. I can't imagine it. Um, and it's interesting that we always see the person who's in a minority position as being the one who's in authority. I don't know that always has to be the case. It could be anyone. It could be anyone in the group. Does anyone have to be an authority? And I would say, no, it will tend to end up that way, though. Getting back again to the need for everybody to have the power to leave the relationship. And that makes everyone be motivated to keep it together if it's working and if it's mutually beneficial. It could work just fine. So let's imagine every possible configuration with the four people, it's pretty easy to imagine, throw in a fifth person. Well, if, if you don't have certain types of negative authoritarian structures, if there's no designated single leader, that could still work. And it could still work even if you did. It starts to sound a little culty. But again, we've gotten rid of the worst part of that is that no one is trapped. And when people talk about cults, they immediately think of imbalance, control, abuse. And it makes sense why they would think that, because that's what it will tend to become. Unless we specifically address that, and we don't let it become that. So even if someone was to try and join a group, and they were not yet in this financially independent position, then our first goal is build that person up so that they are. Don't let them stay in that state. Build up their skills, their connections, their abilities, not just to be dependent upon the group, even for their employment. I mean, like, I love the idea of family businesses, 
But if you get fired and you lose your family, that doesn't sound real fun. Everybody should have enough cash saved in the bank. Not that cash will exist forever. I mean, I'm planning for the downfall of civilization. <coughs> but they should have enough cash in the bank and they should have enough relationships to other groups that they can move to another group. So I love the idea of groups isolating and being very focused on themselves and being relatively insular, certainly being disease isolated. So, so the, in, the group is fidelitous. They do not have sexual relationships with people outside the group. And they have a catalog, catalog of every single disease everyone in the group has. It sounds kind of extreme, doesn't it? Makes total sense. You look at something like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is pervasive. Bunch of people have tuberculosis, over half. You got to check my statistics on that. I forget. And it usually doesn't matter because we're healthy enough that, that that isn't why we usually die. But the truth is a lot of people die of tuberculosis. They die earlier because they get immunocompromised by something else. I'm not a doctor. I just read stuff. Check it out. But like, let's say 60% of people have tuberculosis. Well, it's passed by kissing people and being too close to them. And so you could have families that one of the attributes is we either have or don't have tuberculosis. That's a great thing that to, to have as, a, as, as one of your many distinguishing attributes to your family. Which diseases do you have? There isn't any reason why we should, because if we're going to have people moving from family to family, or as they are now, they're just promiscuous and we spread diseases constantly that we could get rid of in a year. If everybody would just, you know, close up their pants, you know, and, and stop kissing everybody randomly. And if for one year we just isolated, a bunch of diseases would damn near die out. And some diseases we can fix and some we can't. But the point is we're too close to each other. We're too dense. We're too socially dense. We're too packed in. And so we're going to keep passing diseases back and forth and not even know that that's just massive cost to our society, massive cost to the world. And so this is something we could learn from past pandemics, which we now have the ability to understand at a higher level, is that we should isolate from each other in terms of diseases. And that will allow us to be close together, very intimate with each other in smaller groups, but not constantly be passing diseases around. Imagine the medical costs that these diseases have. It's very, very expensive for us to have this lifestyle we have. Just, just think about tuberculosis, and I haven't studied it, but when I did study it, people were like, this is an ignored disease. We could get rid of it if we made any effort. And one of the efforts is to just test everyone. It's a simple test. There's several tests you can do for it. And, and then don't pass tuberculosis to anyone else. And really, I suppose it's on the... Well, it's, it's really on everybody's shoulders to do that, to enforce that. Ideally, the person with a disease would make sure that they never spread it to somebody else. But with a disease like that, where you don't even know you have it, it's easier for them to ignore it. It benefits the person who has a disease to still be hooking up with people who don't, because that gives them more opportunities and doesn't limit them. But really think about it. Do you want to ever give anyone else a disease? The answer, I hope, is no. And so you need a catalog of every disease you have, whether it's the common cold, the flu, COVID, or anything else. Do you want to pass it on? And the answer, hopefully, is no, of course not. And, and if enough people within your group, well, if, if your group even isolates and says that for themselves, they will begin to be protected. They're not immune because people are not totally fidelitous. Even within polyfidelity, somebody could still go have contact with somebody else. How strict are you going to be on it? I want to be very strict on it. And I'm convincing you, I hope right now, that there's benefits given the lifestyle options of doing that, where you're not living in a city, you're not forced to be in everybody else's face, 
and you're certainly not forced to fuck everybody else, then you can restrain yourself within a community of people, get your social needs all met, get your intimate needs all met, and not be passing diseases around. And I almost wonder if there's analogies there for other things as well. Looking at social ills, you know, addictions. Are we passing addictions around like diseases? I think we are. Cigarette smoking would be a great example. If nobody else in your group smokes, you're going to tend not to have pressures to smoke. I've been a non-smoker for many years. And all it takes is one person to enter into my intimate space and smoke, and I will. And that's happened twice. And I've become a person who smokes cigarettes. And I have bad lungs. And it's my fault. I'm not blaming the people who did it. Although I also have a rule where I live. I've set a rule in the space I live. Therefore, a rule for my own life that I don't want smokers here. You can't come here if you're a smoker. And three times, actually, one woman I wasn't actually involved with that much. She's just a really nice person. But she brought cigarettes. To punish her, I took them and I smoked them all right in front of her. Just one after the other. Which was a funny joke for both of us, actually. Because I'm a crazy motherfucker anyway. So she <laughs> wasn't bothered by that. Because she enjoys me and how I am. I thought it was funny. Be good in a movie. But in other cases, it was women who had just smoked sometimes. One woman would have a, a, one cigarette a day. Problem is, and I wouldn't say I have an addictive personality exactly, but if there's stuff around, I'm going to do it. And so I start smoking, and then after she leaves, you know, I end up buying a pack. Because, you know, if I'm going to go into town anyway... I always stock up on everything, but if I have a bunch of cigarettes, I'm going to keep smoking the cigarettes until they're gone. I'll smoke all pack. I'll do the same thing with alcohol. So alcohol, tobacco, your, your community group has to decide how you want to relate to those. And lately I've been thinking, huh, maybe I should be in a, in a, in a relationship and in a community where there's no drinking or cigarettes. There's no smoking or drinking. And I would even include pot in that. Not that pot is bad. It's the smoke. So I would, I would be like, fine with edibles. I have one video I made about vaping, whether or not vaping was allowed in the forest. And at that point, I decided, okay, sure, why not? It is. But I was just making that decision based on one other person here. I don't know. Just make it up. It's not a dictate from God. It's not a rule that is set by one person. It's a rule that's agreed to by a group of people. And it's a different way of looking at rules. They're not dictates that, that actually damage you and limit you if you specifically joined a group that has that particular rule set. And we have the technological ability now to filter out and locate people who fit in with our, our filters that work best for us. There's people who tend to be obese. And they will be obese given the opportunity. If food is readily available all around them, they will eat tons of it, be obese, get diabetes, and be a liability for themselves and the group. They're food addicts. And we think of it differently with alcohol. For some reason, we're, we're, we're very willing to criticize alcoholism. But to criticize obesity would be bad because it's such a popular thing to be, is obese. But it's very bad for your society. It's a disease. It's a killer. It's expensive. It's wasteful. It makes for less useful people, less functional people, and I'll go ahead and say less attractive people. That would be a very unpopular view with fat people. But it's not like you hear alcoholics out there saying, it's great to be an alcoholic. It is actually good to be an alcoholic. I am an alcoholic. I will drink too much if it's available. And that's been fine for most of my life. 
but it also correlates with a lot of the problems I've had in my life. And at this point, it definitely will. I tend to black out much easier, I think. And I don't actually know that because I'm blacked out when I'm blacked out. Blacked out, not meaning I'm conked out. I used to think that's what that meant. It means you don't remember what happened. But you could be highly functional while you then later don't remember what happened at all. And that's something alcoholics don't always realize. And it's taken me a while and, and some uh, listening to some audiobooks and things. And really, I should be videoing myself more. Well, I do video myself a lot. I mean, I have videos that I've published that I don't remember what I said. Now, maybe I'm just getting older, which I am. And your memory does probably go just because of that. But I think also, I was just drunk. And I'm still walking around, talking, blah, 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 blathering on. I'm certainly not drunk right now. I haven't drank in like three days. Which is also fucked with my sleeping pattern because I can't sleep. In other words, what I actually need to be in is, in, I mean, it's okay if other people in the community drink. If they also don't have problems, if they don't have problems with it. Um. But I should not be in an environment where it is fine for me to drink to that level, which for me has become not that much alcohol, really. I black out, I think, much easier now. I think it's because my system is so fucking polluted. I need to go to detox. I need to detoxify myself. More importantly, I need to be in a community where I never have to detox. It's so extremely rare to get drunk. Maybe I still get drunk on the day of the year that everybody gets drunk. We can still have festivals and feasts and go overboard, just like with obese people. We can still have a big feast. But we don't have snacks laying around all the time where you're continually stuffing your face with food. Like, I don't have that problem. But I have found a couple interesting things. One is I live a lifestyle where I don't have a lot of interesting things to do. I'm essentially bored because I don't have any social interaction. And so I've seen that when I do buy snacks and I put them by my computer and I'm working on my computer all day, I will eat all those snacks. If I buy candy, I will eat it all. But if I'm functioning healthily within a society, within a group, I don't have that problem for some magical reason. Very interesting, isn't it? The nature of the group keeps me from having addictions because I'm having my needs fulfilled at the right level in the right way. I think this is also true with sexual addictions, where if you have a surplus of sexual contact in your life, you'll actually find less people having unusual fetishes. Not to say it's bad to have unusual fetishes. I've got a few myself. Lots of people have them. And we should be with people who have compatible ones to us. Great. That works fine. But I believe that if I'm sexually fulfilled, getting enough sex, I actually think about it less. Maybe. I have to draw a graph, kind of a conceptual graph on that. Because not having any certainly does make me think about it more. Having a little bit would make me think about it even more. But then being saturated with enough sex for a while it becomes less a part of my life. I've got my needs fulfilled. And perhaps this is true with diet as well. Perhaps with diet, if we have healthy food available all the time, we don't have a, a poverty mentality or a, a scarcity mentality. Uh, we know it's always available, but we have so many other things we're able to do and are doing, and they distract us, it doesn't become a, an unhealthy focus of our lives. Hmm, there's a lot of interesting thoughts around that. And as you listen to what I'm saying, don't imagine that I'm saying how it has to be. I want you to be exploring these ideas and thinking about that we have choices of what, what values we have and how we function within a society and a group and how that works out for you. And that doesn't mean you can't be part of a larger group that shares a bunch of other ethics. 
you know? And maybe you decide it's okay with you to be unhealthy in one particular way. Maybe you want to be in a community of alcoholics or obese people. Maybe you want to be in a community of obese alcoholics. Okay, go for it. Do it. I don't want to be in a, in a group like that. I don't even want to be in a group of drunks. And I'm an alcoholic. I think it's not a best way to be. And even if I don't have a lot of problems, a lot of other people are not going to handle alcohol as well as I do. And I'm not so sure I do handle it as well as I think I do. How the hell would I even know if I'm blacked out some of the time anyway? I do know this. In a group of people, whether it's a real community or just a gathering of people, if a bunch of people are drinking hard alcohol, some of them are going to get way too drunk. They're going to do things in terms of sexuality that are, that are not consensual because really they're not in positions where they can consent. And then you can get into even legal problems about who can consent and who the hell raped who when they were both drunk. They were both consenting when they were drunk. And then later we're going to pick one gender as being the evil victimizer and the other one the victim. And you know who I'm talking about here. They're going to blame the man. Even if both parties were equally drunk. That makes no fucking sense. That's evil. It's sexist. It's wrong. And you can come up with whatever kind of excuses you want to about how gender plays out in society historically or whatever. But if both parties are consenting when they're drunk and then one of them says after they're not drunk, oh, but I couldn't consent because I was drunk. Uh, no, you can't do that. That's bullshit. Now, we could both think more about that, but my, my, my thinking is we just shouldn't be that drunk. I don't think anybody should ever be in a position where getting that drunk and having intimate relations with anybody in that state that they wouldn't normally have intimate relationships with. Can we make that into a rule that is actually coherent? Somebody has to edit that down to something shorter and more coherent. Like, you can't fuck people you don't normally fuck when you're fucked up. <laughs> That's a funnier way to say it. We can get more concise, though. Um, you can't have new sexual partners that you don't normally have when you're in an altered state of mind. I think that's a legitimate rule. You're not your normal you, so you shouldn't be making decisions you wouldn't normally make. That gets rid of the, the drugs, alcohol, consent issues because you know they're correlated. They're also correlated with being young and stupid. Young, stupid, and drunk? Well, big surprise, there's going to be consent problems. And that's not because men are so evil. It's because young, drunk people are stupid. And they do a lot of stuff they wouldn't normally do. I'm not saying there aren't consent problems within that. In fact, it's a, an environment ripe for consent problems. But I'm saying that they're not all consent problems. And we can get rid of all of them with one simple cultural rule of you never fuck anybody when you're fucked up. Who you don't normally fuck. Because I have had lovers that I fucked their brains out when they were drunk, and I was drunk too, and we had a great time. Many times. And to call that rape because I'm male is an insult to any attempts at having gender equality. We can do that in other areas as well, where we see problems in society... I mean, this is social engineering, right? This is us deciding how we want to live. So let's do that. That's not coercion. That's not us being forced to be that way. Not if we don't have to be in a relationship at all. And I don't want us to ever have to be forced to be in a relationship. I don't want us to ever be stuck. That's the fundamental thing that allows for authoritarianism. That's why governments inherently get evil, because people are stuck with them. One group claims to have a monopoly on violence. They will use that violence to maintain their control, and they will even maintain it to pretend that they have consent of those they govern. 
That is inherently an abusive relationship. The nature of it allows for it. Now, that gets political at that point, where you're deciding, how do we get out of that problem? You can always vote with your feet and leave. I did, but I had privilege to be able to do that. And other people have to risk their lives to move their geographical location to escape an oppressive government. That should never have to happen because governments should not be allowed to be oppressive. We need a worldwide agreement of how that functions and how we can avoid it. What governments are not allowed to do because they're sneaky motherfucking bastards. They, well, they, they attract sneaky motherfucking bastards and they have a monopoly on violence. It will be used against the people unless the people are vigilant in absolutely controlling the use of that power. In other words, the people should control through law who violence is used against and who it is not. The Founding Fathers of the United States said amazing things in that regard. Essentially, they said you should always be willing to overthrow your government. Willing, ready, setting your boundaries, setting your limits, and when those limits are broken, then the contract is off. And you're willing to kill the government. That part of it. Ideally, you don't have to have a fucking actual revolution every few years because a lot of people would die and your society would suck. But you must always be in a revolution against the bad elements of government that will exist because the environment encourages it. It will reward their misuse of violence. They have a tool that they will misuse for self-gain if they can. And that is the definition of the state. It is the the monopoly of violence. So we've gone from talking about two people all the way up to world society. It's not even within your nation that you have to make sure that everyone's free. Everyone in the world must be free. And they're not free now. Which means I'm not free. I'm not okay with it. I'm not okay with other people being abused and enslaved to make my products be cheap. I'm not okay with it, even if that government claims it's consensual. You look at countries that are essentially run by terrorists, and the people there are entrapped and enslaved. I have to go fight against that government, undermine it, educate the people there, arm them, free them, free the slaves everywhere, even the ones who make your cheap products, and even if it means the price of your products is going to go up. It amazes me how much my supposedly kind liberal friends are okay with slavery. They even support governments that encourage slavery in other places. They're house slaves. They don't mind it if the damage and the pain is somewhere else. That is terrible. It's a terrible way to be. It's a terrible way to lead your life. Whether it's in your intimate life with one person or it's at the worldwide political scale. So fight against oppression in your personal relationships and start extending that thought to a bigger picture, a worldwide picture. Because we even have to control ourselves from being addicts to consumption. Because currently, like alcoholics or obese people, we're destroying the entire planet with our consumption. We are literally poisoning our, our, poisoning our bodies and our whole planet. And we will die of that. Just as much as an alcoholic is poisoning himself, just as much as an obese person is, uh, is killing themselves. And obesity, of course, is not the simplest measure. You could be a bulimic and still be a food addict. You could be thin and be a food addict. I'm not an expert on food addictions. And I'm drawing parallels between eating and alcoholism, eating disorders and alcoholism, which some people will object to, I suppose, probably because they are one of those and don't want to be included with the other group. But I see enough similarities there that I think it's a very important analogy 
And when I then look at other addictions, like an addiction to consumption or an addiction to oppression, an addiction to enslaving others, I think you can draw parallels there as well. All these things fit together. The wealthier, fat, and happy, or at least fat and sick, they're ethically sick as well. Because only enslaving other people allows you to get that fat. Well, I'm a little tired of talking. And that's kind of a bummer note to end on, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Oh, well, sometimes things just end up that way. Keep thinking. Keep, you know, think about what I've talked about. Write up your responses to it. Don't just feel them and get cranky about it and say, that guy's a dumbass in this way or that and dismiss me. Things I'm talking about are very important to the survival of the entire planet. And it's important for your happiness. Agreeing with me is not important to your happiness. That's fine. I don't need you to agree with me. I want you, I'm asking you as a request, as another human being, to think about the things I've just said. And some of them will be more interesting to you than others. Fine, focus on those. Tell me where I'm wrong. I hope I am wrong. I probably am wrong. I don't know how I couldn't be. But write it down. Become a very active participant in you thinking with me. Engage in philosophy with me. Not with me as your teacher. Although you're welcome to do that. Especially if you're going to suck my dick or something. <laughs> uh, I'm hilarious. Uh, but... <laughs> But no, do it because it's the best thing to do for us both. To at least know where you disagree with me. Because what I've just modeled, what I've just suggested, as a way of organizing society, could save the entire world. It could save you. It could get you out of the traps that you're in. Your dissatisfaction, your loneliness. The ways in which you're self-destructive. The ways you hurt other people. We could escape from all of that. Please, I beg of you. And if I go look in the mirror, I beg of me to please save me, to please make choices in how I relate to other people so I can stop allowing others to damage me and I can stop damaging myself. We fight here on the home front with ourselves, with an expanded understanding of how things work, really. And we examine every relationship in our lives to improve those and to be actively building up those we choose to be around. We can't actively go around helping out everyone in the world randomly. We can't fix everybody. But we can make sure we're around people that are worth investing in that are also investing in us so that we're not used and abused and we're not users and abusers. And we stop destroying the entire planet that way. One person at a time, starting with you and me. Adios and good luck. You know, I think I'll add to that Use of time. I was just thinking about video games. And it's very easy to criticize people who play video games. I do it. It's a waste of time. I played a video game last night for quite a while because I felt like it. I didn't have anything better to do. My brain wanted something to do. I was tired. And so I spent hours playing this video game. It's a 4X game. I forgot what that means. Exploration, expand, something, basically civilization builders. You know, they come in many forms and they give you a problem set that for me is like a, like a slot machine. It gives me a random reinforcement schedule, psychological term for that, I think. You know, it gives me a little dopamine reward at the exact right inter intermittency that works for me. Um, in the absence of actual, healthy, real, productive 
functioning and relationships. Not saying video games are inherently bad. Certainly not saying they should be banned. In fact, I think they should be improved. I think they're great. We can even make them be more social. And, you know, I'm alone in the middle of nowhere. Nearest person is two kilometers away and I have nothing else to do. But, you know, the years are slowly going by with me letting that happen in my life. And so that's an addiction that is a result of the environment I'm in and wouldn't be that way if I was in a different environment. So I'll change the environment with all the things we've talked about in this video. I'll find a way to change it. probably a list of a whole bunch of other kind of dysfunctional ways we use our time and energy that I would call a waste. And it's not just video games. There's no reason to pick it out as video. It could be card games. It could be, like I mentioned, slot machines. It gives you that little dopamine reward. But the point is that I'm wasting my fucking time. A lot of my time. What would happen if society actively said, we are going to remove addictions to things we don't like. We're going to have pro-social addictions where we, we, we encourage each other, for example, for exercise. You can go overboard with anything. Exercise could be an addiction. But we should be having that particular activity enough that we get the benefits of it without becoming gym rats. I mean, if you're going to be working your body, you might as well be getting some real work done. So this is one of the reasons I'm in favor of having people get a workout by having a menu before them of many physical activities they can do that benefit the society that they're in, whether it's a paid job or not. What we end up doing is paying some people to do all the hard physical labor, and then the wealthy have to go to gymnasiums if they want to be healthy. No, let's just get some landscaping done. Landscaping gives you a wide range of physical activities, and we need to re-landscape the entire world, both literally and metaphorically. We want to actually move dirt all around the world in huge amounts to build better cities that actually function better. For example, we need to dig in. Architecturally, we need to dig in. Well, for now, let's just have bulldozers do that usually, because it seems like really slow and wasteful to do it by hand. On the other hand, it would give us an infinite amount of physical labor to do with wheelbarrows, shovels, pickaxes, and we could look at all the muscles that those tool sets use and add them up and say, well, this is the kind of body, this is the muscles you'd be working if you were to go do that work. And the hardest working guys I know, guys, because it's guys doing the physical work, the hardest physical work is all done by guys, so you get fat chicks around so much, at least in many societies. You know, the guys I know are in great shape because they work really hard. They can move big stuff and they can work for many hours. And instead, everybody should do a little bit of that. But they shouldn't do it in a way that's totally pointless, like doing it in a gymnasium. That's using the addiction and the need wrong. You look at alcoholism. We want to get fucked up. Let's get fucked up. Let's do it the right way. Let's not do too much of any one drug too much. It's bad for your systems. Because there's lots of drugs you can do that don't fuck you up. They're actually quite enlightening. They're good for you. But not done the wrong way. You know, and there's some drugs you can't even use the right way. Especially not when there's better options that do functionally the same thing uh, to you mentally that alter your mental state in ways that we want to to do but aren't dangerous that you can't overdose on like fentanyl no just skip fentanyl entirely leave that to surgeons and medical people who can dose it correctly and are you know fixing your broken body and you know use psychedelics in the appropriate way which might be like twice a year or whatever you know use uh, uh ecstasy tw you know twice a year uh, you know, smoke pot 
enough to get actually high, enough to appreciate the values of that experience once, twice a week. But if you're a pothead all the time, you actually don't get the benefits of it anymore. And I've been a pothead before because it was convenient. I'm not right now. And this is another way that society, your, 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 your community around you can, can regulate your addictive nature by not having something be too available all the fucking time. I mean, I went to a resort once, and it was really nice, and thank you to the person who paid for it, because I was never going to pay for that. That's just not what I pay for, you know? And I didn't get anything done that whole week. I think I gained like 10 pounds. Food was included, all you can eat. And I ate a lot, because I still have a scarcity mentality. You know, I, I grew up kind of hungry. So if there's free food all the time, I'm going to pig out. Proven by me doing it. Now, maybe if I wasn't in a boring resort where there was nothing else to do, maybe I wouldn't have done that. And so that particular system is set up for consumption. The other thing I did was I stood around in the pool all day with my thermos cup and my girlfriend, and we just drank white wine all day. And so we were drunk and eating all week. And there's people whose lives are like that. And it's not that they're evil for being like that. It's that they have the option of being that way. And so we will tend to be that way. That is the nature of people. We were, we were evolved to want to consume. And that consumption leads to our survival and reproduction. The people who ate too much and, and, and sought out as much calories as possible, as much sugar as possible, and stuffed it in their face, reproduced more. People who are oppressors can reproduce easier and they'll raise more oppressors. I just did a big jump there. Sorry about that. But that's kind of what I'm trying to make you do is jump from being a consumer at the level we're evolved to be to seeing how oppression exists in society because those people are culturally and socially evolved in their group to support their consumption and use your labor. All that shit's got to stop. Or we die. We all die, including the oppressors. And you are the oppressor, probably. If you don't realize that, we have a bigger problem. <laughs> it's us. We're in the same fucking boat here. Gaia, planet Earth, spaceship Earth. And we can't do what we're doing. Or we die. Bye.